Perfect. Anybody in digital marketing? Hands up. What is this? A what? Yeah, exactly. A whiteboard. Who knows what a whiteboard is? Now, supposedly I'm not supposed to swear. So if I happen to swear, I'm sorry. There's a lot of bullshit around single customer view. There's a lot of bullshit around technology. Uh, so I just want to sort of break things back into a bit of normality and quickly telling a story about a client, a premium brand, that invited me in to talk or basically assess their approach to single customer view. And it's a bit of a horror story. So when I went in, it was through the tech, uh, through the IT team. I was invited in through marketing, but it, the implementation was through the IT team. They'd spent roughly $1.5 million. They're at month 14. They had no ROI and marketing hadn't even started doing any communications. I won't tell you the rest of the story, but suffice to say, I said, what the fuck? <laughs> we got rid of that company. We got a new company in. Within three weeks, we had a data scientist and myself that had pulled the relevant data together into a single customer view. We'd found some insights that were gold for marketing and created three test strategies. Not saying that I'm the best guy in the world to do SCV, but just saying it can be done really quickly, really simply if you want to, or can be really complex and you can take lots and lots of time. And Tim, when Tim speaks, we'll talk about some of the bigger companies and what they're doing. Um, but the long and short of it is you need an actual strategy. You need a framework to work to. So today I want to just unveil what SCV or single customer view uh, is all about and what sort of key data uh, you should implement or think about when doing single customer view. So I know who's digital marketer, who's an IT department or tech team here? Anyone? One. So the rest of you are all in marketing or anyone in product? One product. Anyone in call centers? Contact center. Is there a social media team here? A couple of you. So most of you are in marketing, yeah? All right. Has anyone done a value segmentation on their customer database? Excellent. Gold star, bottle of champagne for those three. All the rest of you, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> Seriously. Okay. Excuse my French. If you haven't done a value segmentation, it's really quite simple. So taking a database, let's just say you've got 100,000 customers. So I'll talk about prospecting in a minute, but I'm just going to focus on a customer side of things. So take your customer database. Let's say, what's the size of a database? Anyone want to share? The amount, about, the, amount about to, the amount about to eat. What, 10,000 customers, 100,000 your business? 190,000 customers, right? So you look at the value of those 190,000 customers. It might be $10 million, whatever it is. You can split it into a super high, high, medium, and low value segment. But anything you do should be based on profit. And Tim and I are having chat earlier, and Gil and I are having chat earlier. Marketing should be looking at single customer view as incremental profit or profit growth. Forget revenue, forget sales. It should be all about driving profit. Marketing should be valued and marketing should be about driving incremental profit. Otherwise, don't do single customer view. Don't do half the things that are there that are available through technology. So to do that, you could break it into 10 bands so that 190,000 customers, let's just say they're worth $10 million. You could break that into 10 bands of a million dollars each, let's say. Then you look at how many customers are in each of those segments. Make sense? Just nod or go, nah, doesn't make sense. Um, so you're looking at how many customers are in those value segments. So that's the 80-20 rule, fairly basic. 80% of value comes from 20% of customers. I'm sure you've heard that, yeah? So I've proven that across a whole bunch of different industries. And the reason I'm starting with this is this is where marketing should start with single customer view. Because if, if you have all the data together on a customer, so Gil, we know his value, we know all the products, all the services, all the in-app purchases, whatever he's buying at events, paying for events. If I know his value, I can work out where he sits, whether he's super high, whether he's high, whether he's medium, whether he's low uh, value. And most customers are sitting down here. So on that 190,000 database, there's lots and lots of low, medium or low value customers or even negative value customers that are losing you money. No one from Tel <coughs> Telstra <coughs> or Combank here today, I hope. I won't use any names. Okay. 
So in these, you look at the average value. Average value, average value. So the average value, let's just say, again, let's just say, uh, what do we got? A thousand customers. Make it simple. So we've got a thousand customers. You're looking at the value. If this average value was 10 times the average value is $100, let's just say. So an average value of $100 for whatever this client is. If it's 10 times the average value, that's worth 10 times 100 <laughs> is 1,000, simple. So I'm just saying if the average database, that 190,000 let's say, or 1,000, if the average value is 100 bucks profit to a company, this group is 10 times as valuable. So it's 1,000, if this is 5 times, 2 times, and a half times, that's 500, 200, 50. Is that making sense? I'm just trying to work out that these are 10 times as valuable up here five times as valuable, twice as valuable, half as valuable as the average. My question in, the, in looking at the data is what made these guys so valuable and these not so valuable? So you're starting to look at obviously all the products, the services, the events, again, in-app, purchases, throw it out. What else, what else do people pay for in your respective businesses, which might be B2B, B2C? Anyone, what are people paying for? Downloadable content, yep. Content. Yeah, subs, really good one. Recurring revenue, whatever it might be, probably subs. So whatever it is, you can analyze what is driving that profit. And in that sort of horror story I told you before, we could find the premium products, the mid-value products, and the low-value products, and all the services and events they are running, and start to see what was actually driving value. And it wasn't rocket science, it was really obvious the answer. But the company that was originally working on it had taken, as I said, 11 months to even start to get to pulling some of the data together, which is just a waste of time. So does that makes sense? That's just putting a fairly basic value segmentation on your database. I'll come back to why this is really important once I've done a square. So I'm a simple man, triangles and squares. If you want to take anything away from this morning, triangles and squares. Tweet it, triangles and squares. Bench told me, Anton did, triangles and squares. Okay, so that's the value pyramid. All we're doing is breaking this into what used to be loyalty, what I've proven is an engagement. So if you can drive engagement, you can increase value. So everyone talked about it, everyone, you know, social media came on, it was all about let's drive engagement up and let's get engaged customers, let's get them in social media, etc. The problem with that is most people didn't prove it because you couldn't pull in the data to a single customer view. Social sat out here. Unless you had an app, in which case you could pull in social data and you could start to build it into the single customer view. So it was a silo. And most digital teams have gone off and looked at the silo of digital as opposed to this full value breakdown. So starting to prove silo of digital working or silo of social working. Hello, mobile came on, we don't have cookies anymore. So we start to work on Cookie data and non-cookie data, geolocation and, and device ID, etc. that doesn't necessarily all match. So you don't get a pure customer view. So come back to the minute. So this is still value. This is still the triangle going up. This is engagement. So this is where I start to get you to feed back and I start to walk around and pick on people that are eating. So engagement, what is engagement? What's some engagement <coughs> points in your marketing programs? Video views, yep. What's that? Channels. channels. What channels? Yep. Heap of web web channels. Investing in shares or? Okay. Sorry, I was being facetious. Shares, yes. So heaps of, yeah, content shares, likes, shares, uh, ratings and reviews. Everyone got ratings, product ratings and reviews? Ratings, reviews, email, obviously an old one, login, so any login data. If you've got your own communities, hubs, you know, the banks, everything's login, etc. cetera. Um, In-app, so apps, anyone got an app here? All the in-app interaction data, again, uses device login. Uh, call center, I know no one's from a call center, it's a bit old school, like a whiteboard. But again, how many people are calling off your web that aren't using web chat 
calling into an actual call center. Can you link that data together through IDs? So you've got call center, email, so it's endless. The point is if you want to prove this theory, you want to work out what data to capture to measure value. So how many products, how many services, what events are you running where people are paying, what areas are people paying for, like downloadable content, etc. Add all those numbers up, which gets to a value for each of you individually, and then go out through this matrix to say what's your level of engagement from low to high. So once I know all that, I can get what's called a single customer view. Now the challenge for you is to base it only on the most important interaction points. And this is where lots of companies go wrong and they try and get all the data together and say, let's put all this information together and stitch all our channels together. Let's then look at multi-device and multi-channel together and it's a bloody big data mess, as Mike opened up with, that actually marketers can't use. And that's the train wreck I keep seeing, that everyone's trying to get to this nirvana of all the data together rather than saying, let's agree the types of products and information we can capture. And there's some that goes to offline retail that you can't capture, and there's some that you can. There's some now obviously with programmatic media and targeting where you can determine the device ID of mobile, for example, or it's probabilistic. So I don't actually know, it's maybe only 60% of the customers I can identify. That's fine, work out what you can identify that drives value, measure that. Then agree, what are the most important elements that you believe should drive engagement? When I say that, I mean what level of engagement do you think will get people closer to your brand that will drive incremental profit? So forget, to a degree, the likes, the nice soft stuff in social, the nice fluffy stuff that you're doing. No offence to half the marketers in the room. But get back to saying we can drive experiences and wonderful engagement with the view to getting people closer to our brand for two reasons. Advocacy or buying more stuff. No more complex than that. Does that make sense? So, if you have this framework, you can then go, this area here, strategically, should be VIP. They're super high value, so they're buying truckloads of your product. This area is highly engaged, meaning of all these interaction points, you've measured them actively clicking or doing something or downloading or going to an event, coming to an event like this or whatever they're doing, so they're leaning forward, so they're into your brand, which is good. But some people don't like to engage. So I often have a question where people go, but what about the people that don't like to engage, don't like to share, don't like to do whatever, but they buy truckloads of your brand? That's fine, they're sitting over here. And I'll tell you a reason why. Who's running an advocacy program here or a referral strategy? Okay, so have you gone to everyone who's got a high social network or sphere of influence? To some extent. To some extent. So to most extent, that's the answer I hear. People go, yeah, we look for the high, you know, people have 5,000 friends and are highly active in social media. And you go, great. What a fucking waste of time that is. Sorry, I wasn't supposed to swear. Um, the reason is that theory is targeting all these people. So they're highly engaged. What you don't know is how valuable they are. So they're highly active in social media, but they're high, medium and low value if you worked out their value from a single customer view point of view. And the majority of people are down here. They're just annoying people that like to make a noise in social media. So they're actually low value to your brand. So when you think about it and step back, you go, why do I want those people to be noisy about my brand? They don't really love my brand. They're not buying much of it. What are they really saying about you? Or is it really fickle? You know, they say something really nice about you this week and then next week they had a bad experience on the, on the phone, whatever, and say something bad. So I challenge you all to go, Stick to that. If you're doing advocacy programs, find out your higher value customers that are also super engaged and just harness them. Can't quite read that, but that would be the idea of single customer view. If I knew how engaged they were and how valuable they were, just go to that very top right. And again, in all of this, and, and Gil will talk about it, you can test. A, B test or multivariate test, what do you want to do to find out who really is engaging and is an advocate of your brand and focus on those. These get a VIP experience, and by that I mean you don't spend huge amounts of money on them. 
you create great experiences. So if it's a physical retail store, you get the parking spot right near the front door, for example. If it's airlines, you get the seats up near the front of the plane, you get the champagne, etc., in the lounge. So these are low cost touches, or you get the red carpet treatment, you get straight through to a call center, you don't get put on hold. Um, your web experience is content that makes it feel platinum or gold as opposed to bronze. Could be perceptually color, you know, whatever it is. Really low cost ideas that make you feel like a very important person. You then test a whole bunch of strategies here to try and upsell or cross sell to sell more product or sell more services or engage people. You test here to drive engagement and get them leaning forward, downloading the video, uh, watching the video, do a rating of it, maybe sharing it, and then bang, hit them with an offer to buy or whatever. Does that make sense? Does that sound relatively simple? Lots of nodding, which is good. It should sound simple, because that's the theory. The complexity is in today, we obviously have multi-channel, which you know, I've come through the 90s. So I came through the 90s, just quickly, my background, through direct marketing, which none of you would have come through direct marketing, you're way too young, uh, which is the 90s, it was CRM was going to be the saviour of the world, except Tim and I. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> we're both grey hairs. Um, CRM was talked about, so customer relationship management, putting into a system which was going to give you single customer view, and away you go. Obviously then, computing power, uh, social media, mobile, now programmatic, etc. We've gone from multi-channel to now multi-device. As I talked about, you've lost that cookie to device ID uh, match to a degree. Um, it's become harder and harder and harder. When anyone talks about single customer view within your businesses, can you go back and challenge them just to say, let's first of all think about what is the ROI? So back to my opener, they spent 1.6 1, 1 1 .6 million dollars, hadn't done any marketing programs, hadn't fully costed it. So I'll make it up. Let's say it was about two and a half. Say it probably would have been two and a half million to start getting stuff into market. Now they're a premium brand, but how much product would you need to sell to break even? If it's average value of 100 bucks, and sorry, we're talking profit. So on those sales, what profit do you need to drive to get two and a half million dollars? You need two and a half million dollars to break even in profit. So that's 10 million, 20 million dollars in sales. So once you start thinking like that, you go back to, shit, okay, how many of these customers are on the database? 190,000. The bulk are here, I'll make it up, let's say 100,000. What's your name? I didn't get your name. Steve. On Steve's database, so there's 100,000 here. There might be 50,000 there, and there might be another 40,000 up the top. So you know response rates. If you start looking at some of the campaign activity you're doing, you could get 1%, you might get 10%, doing really well, 20, 25%. Start doing your maths and go, right, from 40,000, 10%, that's 4,000. Buying some products, that's $400,000. I'm nowhere near the 2.5 million yet. So it just starts to put a framework on what the hell are we doing? Why are you doing single customer view? What information should you pull together to even get single customer view? And then how much activity do you actually want to do through marketing? And given you're mostly marketers, I won't go beyond that, but you should be thinking sales teams, product teams, customer service teams, etc. And marketing probably does encompass social, mobile, and all that side of things. Um, and now with Internet of Things and augmented reality and all these new opportunities, how do you capture that data? So it's all great stuff to test, but you need to go back to a framework and start to think about, ultimately, I think ROI. So my, my main point is, what the heck is a single customer view? If you don't think about the return on investment before you set it up, it'll be a train wreck. And then once you have all that in place, of course you can start to look at overlaying your segmentation, with your segmentation strategy, all the demographic data, all the psychographic data, you know, attitudes, experiences, all the stuff your team's probably doing or your research department's doing. But that's an after thought. So most marketers start with, I've got this beautiful segmentation. You go, great, what the hell are you doing with it? Oh, we've broken five different personas and the creative agency's done this and that and this and that. It looks magnificent. Great, did it drive incremental profit? I don't know. 
get the next campaign out. We're not worried about looking at the results, are we? The post-implementation review is not due for another 60 days. Fuck that, results. <laughs> so you've got to be really careful. Overlaying a segmentation is great, but overlay your segmentation onto that matrix to work out whether those segments are different in terms of profit rather than just looking differently. Psychographic is great, you know, attitudinal or experience with your brand or experience with a product. So by experience, I mean if you think of um, technology, do you have low level of knowledge, do you have mid-level of knowledge, do you have high level of knowledge? If I knew that, if that was a question I asked, or parenting, do you have low knowledge, mid knowledge, you know, high knowledge of having, having a baby? First baby, second baby, third baby, etc. All that applies to every industry. If I knew that as a golden question when you signed up to the database, I could pull that information to single customer view, great, drive a strategy on that. Drive knowledge. That's probably about it. Does that make sense? Has it changed your thought about single customer view at all? Good. On oh, someone smirk. Great. I'm gonna pick on someone. The smirk. There's always one smirk in the green shirt. Straight to you as she has a cup of coffee. <laughs> what were you thinking? Sorry, I was picking on you um, when I said that. When you say, can you share, when you say, do it differently? Um, can you expand? <laughs> or not? You don't have to. We don't know what brand you work for. Um, so for okay, yep. So charities, yeah? So donations, you're looking for if you think about dollars, donation, dollars, whatever's involved, selling product and whatever you're doing, and then engagement for you is then how active people are in understanding ActionAid, what do they do, where do they do it, how involved am I with it, am I sharing content there, stories, etc. So you could do the same, it can be really simple. Just look at what your engagement points are. Um, you know, you do great videos and testimonials and case studies and stories. You get them out there through social channels. Are people sharing them? If you had it off your website, which I'm sure you probably do, that's all trackable. So that's what I'm saying. You can keep this as simple as you want for whatever company, um, but just agree what are the key action points. Because you're probably putting into Google Analytics your goals. So you just want to track those goals back to a unique ID. So you want someone's email address, which I'm sure you get people to opt in by giving an email address. And the reason I'm saying that, I've just worked on a, on a big charity, global charity, and looked at their big four markets, UK, US, Canada, Australia, and same challenge. Charities are all down this path of lost in grabbing donations and spreading the word through social media, as opposed to going, who were the people that were highly engaged in our activities, our campaigns, and this case study I've just worked on, I said last 10 years. Let's look at the last 10 years. Who was actively involved in every campaign for the last 10 years? I said, we can't do that. We don't have the data. We changed the system four years ago. We did something else six years ago. We had a Band-Aid start of it you know, when we first started. Great. What can you do? So we got five years. And we found a group of people that were highly engaged, had been involved, up here, in every campaign for the last five years and donated X amount of money and got, I can't tell the number, but over X number of people to donate money. Now don't you think we should have treated them differently and respected them and gone, you've been with us for five years, probably longer, you've done something for us every five years, I should treat you as a VIP, as opposed to email out, here's our new campaign this year, hope you get involved with us, which is almost a slap in the face, given they love their cause. Yeah? It's probably about run out of time. Thank you.